Welcome to Scrutinize My System. This episode, we're going to the 80s to the very beginning of Mac OS's family tree to dig up his origins and other interesting features that withstood the test of time. Before I start, though, I need to make a disclaimer. Pinpointing the origin of Apple's bread and butter operating system was rather difficult. Early in the company, Apple was utilizing several different operating systems, including Apple DOS, Apple's sophisticated operating system, and Pro DOS. There were also a version labeling issue, which will be talked about in another episode. So this episode, we're going to start with Apple's first and arguably the most expensive GUI they have ever released, the Lisa Office System. Lisa was supposed to be the ultimate machine. It was the dual office machine that was built to run everything at once. Most had sockets for external hard drives while accommodating floppy drives for installing software and saving files. It had networking capabilities that allowed it to connect to servers and access files remotely. It was one of the earliest beasts to support both a GUI and a mouse that was commercially available. The processor was a Motorola 68000, clocked at 5 MHz chosen specifically to run 60-bit programs Apple was developing for the machine. The monitor was a 2-bit CRT screen at 720 by 364 The chassis was beige to blend in with the common office. As for the operating system, the Lisa office system was designed exclusively for the Apple Lisa as the name implies. Around this time, standards in the digital world were more suggestions than requirements, making cross-compatibility and emulation rather difficult. So each computer needed a custom-built operating system, as well as drivers, just to be used. Alright, so we got the virtual machine up and loaded, and before I start rambling on, let's go ahead and actually start digging into this thing, and I will show you how this thing runs. So I've got a hard drive, virtual hard drive, already loaded onto this thing. One thing I did want to mention, though, is that the file system on this is very completely different than pretty much any of the other computers that were existing at this time and even today it has a completely different file system and we'll talk more about that as I'm demonstrating this so let's go ahead and load this up I currently have it set to 5 megahertz as the processing speed which was the standard for the Lisa office system this emulator has the option for 32 megahertz and I'll probably switch back and forth just because the mouse is a little laggy when it's on 5 megahertz I'm pretty sure that's just the emulator, but so there it is. The Lisa Office System release 3.1. This is a Lisa 7.7. I think the Lisa 7.7 refers to the actual machine. The release 3.1, obviously they had a couple different releases of this to work out the bugs, which they worked out some of them. There's still a lot in here, and we'll talk more about that in a second. So let's go ahead and start from the beginning. I'll show you the immediate options that are available here. So you got the desk, the file print, edit, and housekeeping. Notice that there's no Apple logo on the corner over here. That's not going to be introduced until the Macintosh, and we'll talk about that in the next episode. So the desk. Typically, there's a couple different programs here that will just come right up when you up when you essentially turn on a program. So they will start showing up here. File and print. Um, this is basically your regular file menu on most computers nowadays. And edit. You can copy, you can paste, you can do all that stuff. Now, this is before the keyboard shortcuts. I mean, I, I guess there are keyboard shortcuts on here. There's a cut, which is Apple X, copy, Apple C, paste, Apple V. Then you got select all, which is Apple A. Um, I can't really do that with a keyboard through the emulator, but the shortcuts are there in the actual machine. So housekeeping, you can eject disks, which I don't know if I have one up here. Straighten up icons. Let, why don't we show you that one real quick? I'll start dragging these all over the place. Now again, you'll have to uh, you have to excuse the uh, the slow response on the uh, mouse because the emulator is kind of a little wacky with the mouse, so. Let's go to housekeeping, we'll go ahead to straighten up icons, and that will just put everything right back where it went to. Now, it is a little slow because, again, this was a 5 megahertz uh, clock speed on the processor, which they did have faster ones at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
But this machine took about five years to develop, which when they initially did it, they were anticipating the CPU speed was going to stay at 5 megahertz. So let's go to the control panel. I'll show you all the, all the options in here. It's going to take a second to load because, again, I have it set to 5 megahertz. This warning always comes up. Preferences have been told that there is an expansion card in slot 2, but there is actually no card in this slot. That's just misconfiguring. I just didn't feel like doing the full thing on here. Now, this control panel is primitive. I'm just going to flat out say it right now. And for how old this machine is, I can understand it being primitive. Instead of having the little menu on the side over here, what you have to do is you come up up here and you move your mouse over a box. It'll turn into a check. You click on that. The box goes black and you get your options. So from here, you got the screen contrast. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. You can make it darker. You can make it brighter. Um, I love this disclaimer on the side over here where it says, before setting the contrast, adjust the brightness on the back of the Lisa until the edges of this box are sharp. Now, this machine came with a CRT screen, which is one of those big tube ones, and you have to calibrate those because the LCD screens nowadays, the LEDs, whatever you're using at the top right now, has pixels on it that essentially redef that define all the little boxes and everything. Cathode ray tubes, everything was analog, so you had to calibrate everything. You had to tweak it. You had the little knobs on the back of the machines. Um, time that probably a lot of you have yet to see. You'll probably find a CRT in the garbage here and there, but that's that's basically how these uh, things operated. They were all analog, and I'm not going to ramble too much about it. Dim level, this sets a um, time that the screen will dim to. There wasn't really a screen per, or a screensaver on this thing, so burn-in was pretty common with these machines, especially with the CRTs. Uh, speaker volume. That is really loud. And that is really loud, and the virtual machine is starting to lag. Let's see if I can Okay, there it goes. So the speaker volume, basically this just beats because there's not really any sound drivers or anything that's installed on here. Uh, repeating keys, you got the delay rate, mouse double click delay, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, next menu, come up here, select defaults, it'll switch it over. Uses printer as default. Image writer, in case you're wondering, Apple originally had their own printers before they started uh, contracting Canon and HP and all those other companies to sell printers through their own website. So once upon a time, they tried making their own printer. They tried making their own a lot of stuff, and we'll talk about it in later episodes, including a game system, but it, most of that flopped. Uh, start up from, you can choose your on your machine which bootable drive you want to boot from. Obviously I had this set as a parallel connector which is the external hard drive but in this case it's a virtual hard drive anyways. You can have it test the memory, you can do a thorough test or a brief test just to make sure everything's connected properly. Uh, connect devices. This one labels all the different ports that are on the computer. You have two serial ports here, you got a parallel port, you have three expansion slots on the inside of the computer and typically what you can do is you can just come down here, check it, and it will give you the option to switch everything around. So you can put a, I don't know what a Priam card is. You'll, if anyone knows that, leave, leave a comment. I'm curious about that. Um, so you can do a couple different connectors there. You can do a two port card, which you got an upper connector, lower connector, and then just nothing. Uh, Install device software, it'll prompt you to put in a micro, they call it a micro disc yet, but it was a five and a quarter size. And the Apple Lisa took its own special floppy disk, which made things a lot more difficult for cross compatibility and everything. I, I already mentioned that earlier. Uh, you can remove device software. So I can come down here and let's say I have an archive tape I no longer want. I can check on that. Are you sure you want to remove this software before the archive tape? Excuse me. For the archive tape. 
So I can click OK, it'll remove it. I, I'm just going to click Cancel. I don't feel like removing it. So that's the control panel. Now before I close this, I want to show you something as well. You notice that there are no X buttons. There's no blocks or anything at the top of the menu here. It's just the actual bar. And you have a little icon on the corner over here. Typically with this one, instead of having to cl click on the boxes on the corners over here, for the Apple Lisa, you had to click on the icon itself. You had to double click it in order to close it. So things were a little different in regards to that. Uh, wastebasket I'll demonstrate in a second. Clipboard I'll demonstrate in a second. Let's go ahead and go straight to the disk. And here's where things get a little confusing because under normal circumstances if you wanted to o create a folder you would either right click it on a, a Windows computer or on a Mac computer you would come up here and click create a new folder. With a Lisa instead of doing that you have to come to this stack of folder or folders I should say that says empty folders double click it and then you got your folder now again everything's running slow because I have it clocked at 5 megahertz this is the typical speed of the machine at the time <clears throat> so if your machine is running this slow that's just the way it was designed so something else I want to test is the naming system. So I'm gonna make a folder that says test and while you have it highlighted you can come up here you can display the properties the attributes of test. And there's a couple cool things in here. You got the created date, you got the modified date. Now keep in mind this says it was created in 1969 or it was modified in 1969. I want to tell you something about the clock in a second. Now the protection, you can put a password on here. Let's say test. And then every time you want to open the folder, you gotta type in the password, and then you're in. And remember to close it, you have to come up to this icon, double click it, and then it closes. So that's folder Let's go ahead and make a second folder because I want to demonstrate something else. Most machines will rely on the file names for the directory or the folder names. But check this out. I can have two folders with the exact same name. And the reason being is because these folders have a serial number on them and rely on the serial number for the Apple Lisa directory instead of the actual names of the folder. Why they did, I'm not not quite sure. Again, this was a very early machine and it took five years of development and they're just kind of trying to see what sticks on the board. So we can come to attributes a test. It doesn't exactly tell you the serial number on here, but I can take the password off of the folder. And there's no password anymore. And then from here, I can drag this folder, throw it into this folder, and that's how your file system works. So with that said, the copy and paste on here is a little wonky, and I'll show you that in a second. I don't know if that's the emulator or if that is the actual machine. So we can go ahead and notice that when I came over here and copied it, I had the whole folder highlighted, but it just copied the text, which just says test. I should verify that I'm going to create a third folder, and then we'll come up to here, edit, and paste. And then we got test. So that's how the clipboard works. It just copies the text. It doesn't necessarily copy the file itself. To do that you come up here and click duplicate and then you get a second one. So the copy and paste for the file system is a little different than the copy and paste for the text. So you got this blinking 
and now we've got three different folders. Now, we don't want the folders anymore. So, let's go ahead and highlight all three of these folders, and we will drag them to the wastebasket. And again, this machine's running a little slow. That's just the way they designed it. So, from here, you got the three folders in the wastebasket. And strangely, you can still open them in the wastebasket. But, while here, if you want to get rid of them entirely, you come up to. Oh, you got to select it first. You got to select the wastebasket, come up to a housekeeping, and then click empty wastebasket. And now they're gone. So that's how the wastebasket and the clipboard work. And that's how you copy the files compared to copying text. Now, the next one I want to demonstrate is the clock. Normally, this seems pretty self explanatory. You have your dates, you have your time. As soon as this thing's done loading, I'm talking too fast. Okay, here we go. So, right now, the date here is set to March 2nd, 1987, at 11.54 a.m. But here's the catch with this thing the clock relied on the Apple Lisa hardware which is part of the reason why um, operating systems at the time had to be custom made for your operating systems but I already talked about that so for this clock they took a couple shortcuts the first shortcut was they were thinking that this machine was only gonna last a couple of years so instead of having the four digit number for the year to make it Y2K compliant they not only not made it Y2K compliant, but check this out. You're limited between the years 1981 and 1995. So this message here says the year must be a number between 81 and 95. The last keystroke was discarded. I just pressed up on the keyboard. So. so why you're restricted to that was the shortcut they took in the actual machine is the year was stored in a 4-bit integer. 4-bit as in there's four ones and zeros. And having four options, you multiply that by, well, that's actually 2 to the power of 4, which will give you 16. So you only have 16 options, and for some reason being limited at 1981 instead of the 1980, I don't know. They they weren't. I don't know what was going on with this one. So let's go ahead and close this clock. Now closing the disk, you'll notice that the clock shows up on the actual desktop, but it's still technically stored on the disk. Why that that happens, I'm not quite sure, but that's just the way they designed it. So the calculator is the next one. That's pretty self-explanatory. That one's pretty straightforward. I do have a double-clicking issue with the emulator, so I'm not going to blame that one on the machine itself. I do have this message that keeps popping up, though, and I'm pretty sure that's the emulator again. So the calculator cannot remember how you customize it. The calculator will be customized as a four-function calculator. And I love how it just gives you like a little... Um, it italicizes the W's for some reason, but I'm, I don't know why. So it's a basic calculator. 5 plus 5 is going to give you 10. Pretty straightforward except it's pretty slow. So that is the calculator for you. I can take this clock and I can just drag it right back to the disk and it will disappear off of the desktop. So that's all the options on the actual Lisa machine. But I do want to show one more thing and that's how to shut it down. There are no options in the actual menus up here to actually do a soft shutdown but there is still an option to do a soft shutdown to do it you go to the actual machine and you press the power button and it gives you this
So that is the Apple Lisa in a nutshell. Lots of flaws, really expensive machine, costs as much as a Camaro, but it was revolutionary at the time because it was the first widespread, well, at least the first attempted widespread graphical user interface that Apple tried to capitalize on the market. Um, I'll show a successor in the next episode, the Macintosh, or I should say the system software. Um, if you like watching these videos, please subscribe for more videos, and thanks for watching.